Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Jan Sixtens and I'm the acting rector of the Riga Graduate School of Law. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you here uh, at the conference on uh, the uh, future of legal education that is organized by RGSL. And um, today I really feel proud. It's not that I feel proud of being 20 years old, which I'm not, but um, I'm proud to realize that I have something in common with virtually each and every uh, one in this distinguished audience. Um, and that something is uh, a linkage that all of us have with the Riga Graduate School of Law. Um, some of us have worked here or still continue to work. Uh, some of us have studied here. Uh, still others have found a um, trustworthy cooperation partner in RGSL. Um, in a way, we, we are brought together by the past. And we could spend hours and hours reflecting on this uh, glorious past and uh, perhaps, you know, we could mention or at least uh, discuss, um, say, the role of RGSL in transforming the way the law is taught uh, and studied uh, throughout the post-Soviet space. Uh, we could definitely reflect on uh, the contribution of RGSL to the changes in the legal profession and perhaps last, last not least, uh, we can uh, certainly discuss uh, whether uh, RGSL has helped put Riga on the global map of international legal education. But um, that's all history. That's all past. Um, I think um, when we were discussing at RGSL the way how we would like to celebrate our t uh, 20th birthday, our uh, 20 years, um, we arrived uh, at a conclusion that we should use our past to actually look into future. Um, because all of us have something to say about what the future could look like. Um, moreover, I think RGSL as, as an institution is still indecently young to you know, immerse in long conversations about how good the youth was. Uh, we're still agile, we're still innovative, and we're still ambitious. Um, and it is these values, I think, that uh, helped turn our GSL into a uh, vibrant, forward-looking institution of higher education. And uh, it is these values also that guided our choice of the celebratory event today. Um, so legal profession is undergoing major changes. At least this is how I, who is not a lawyer, must confess, um, see this, this profession. I think that um, um, there are new uh, subfields uh, in law emerging, um, owing not least to multidisciplinary fashion uh, in global science. Uh, I think we're just beginning to grasp the role of uh, 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 information technologies 
uh, in the changes of legal profession. And, uh, well, some economists could, could easily argue that uh, the great meltdown uh, of 10 years ago has also changed the way uh, clients interact with, uh, with lawyers. So uh, with this event, with this conference, we want to facilitate this discussion about <clears throat> Uh, these matters and, and others matter uh, and other matters, but there's more to that. Uh, we also want to be part of these changes. Uh, we want to educate next generations of lawyers who are not only skilled professionals, but who are also inspiring broadly uh, looking leaders of tomorrow. And with this ambition in mind, uh, I wish all of us insightful discussions here, and I wish uh, smart growth to RGSL. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to give floor to um, a chairperson of the European Affairs Commission of the Parliament of Latvia, Mrs. Lolit Chigan, please. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, great possibility to address you today. Dear Mr. Extens, dear faculty, students, graduates, law practitioners, I am uh, standing here with the best regards from the Latvian Parliament, which sometimes lacks agility, sometimes lacks innovation, sometimes lacks ambition to make a genuine decisions, uh, genuinely uh, uh, decisions that are genuinely directed towards development of uh, our country or our future, but the fact that we have Riga Graduate uh, School of Law actually makes our decisions better. And uh, I've encountered in my work as a member of parliament your graduates on many occasions, and they are agile, innovative, ambitious, and broad-minded. And we really need to mainstream that way of approach and thinking in our everyday work. So your graduates are most welcome to come and work for the parliament, to work in the public administration, because it makes a lot of difference. And also recently I have had a chance to meet a lot of uh, students from other regions that are being educated in your school in uh, different international programs. And they are also agile, innovative, and ambitious. And I wish them well to return to their home countries and to in a genuinely committed way work for the developments of their respective countries. And since I am a politician, I am prone to think about the development of uh, politics and about political processes. And I believe that um, my generation, we who grew up uh, together with the new, uh, renewed uh, Latvian independence and the, uh, the, re the renewed Latvian state, we, to a very large extent, share some beliefs about how politics are going to evolve and what uh, uh, the future holds us, uh, for us. And one of the things is that some of us, or many of us, uh, share the belief that the progress is inevitable, uh, that we will be progressing, although sometimes it was fights, sometimes it was difficulties, sometimes it was fallbacks, but generally the progress is inevitable. Uh, the liberal, democratic, rule of law thinking will gradually spread. It will take over the Baltic region, the Central European region, and then it will spread towards the, what we know now as Eastern Partnership region, Central Asia, and it's inevitable. Then there was a different thinking that coexisted, but probably was not so much in fashion while we were 
so much overwhelmed by this uh, inevitability of progress. And that was that of eternity. And these are not my terms. These are actually terms of Timothy Snyder, a great thinker and also analyst of our uh, region's history. And he's talking about uh, politics of eternity. And he says that uh, the human progress is always a progress that progresses and then regresses, that there is construction and then deconstruction, and that this is an inevitable circle uh, that always happens so. And I believe that many of us, if we were asked some five years ago, we would say, no, we don't subscribe to this belief. Now we are probably starting to doubt and think that probably the progress is not that inevitable and maybe there will, would be um, decomposition or uh, deconstruction of uh, beliefs and this path to progress. And I think that many of you, uh, similarly to us uh, in the parliament, we see that this actually holds true. And uh, we have probably entered uh, this uh, stage of um, eternity where we saw progress and now we are seeing regress. And uh, what do we do and how do we deal with that? And here I want to say that the legal profession, the legal practitioners, the legal minds actually play such an important role exactly now. Because you are the ones who can actually make sure that things are irreversible. And now I'm completely differently thinking about the many hours a lot of lawyers spend in drafting some small passages in law because this work that has gone into this drafting actually makes sure that the regress when it comes is not possible because there is an institutional setup, there is rule of law, there are laws that need to be adhered to and that importantly shape maybe not so good uh, tendencies in still rule of law way. And I really want to stress once again that the legal profession nowadays, in my opinion, is becoming more and more important for upholding these values of rule of law. And what is very interesting uh, that um, seeing the recent developments in the US, uh, many of us are really concerned. And I think for you as legal practitioners and lawyers, campaign slogans like lock her up are terrifying. But nevertheless, what we have seen in the US is that lawyers of different political beliefs and leanings have actually come together, come together in defense of rule of law. And no matter what political sympathies they might say, they still are very determined to argue for the principle of upholding rule of law. And this is our hope. This is our hope that the progress that we have made is irreversible specifically because we have created institutions, we have created legal international world order, we have created laws that govern human behavior. So my best regards uh, from Parliament as I said and congratulations on your 20th birthday and have a wonderful conference. Thank you. Um, many of us tend to think that there is a guardian angel somewhere for each of us. And um, in our case, uh, in the case of RGSL, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Latvia has been such a guardian angel uh, that uh, has uh, uh, helped us look after our own interest uh, over those 20 years and um, uh, that uh, has developed also uh, other forms of uh, cooperation between the ministry and the school. And therefore, it is my uh, great pleasure to give floor to uh, Mr. Norman Spanke, Inspector General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Professor Ixten, professors, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, students, uh, graduates, uh, friends, uh, may on behalf of the Minister of Foreign Affairs congratulate you on the 20th anniversary of Riga Graduate School of Law. Through, I think through, from the Minister's point of view, through hard work, work uh, innovations, uh, you have secured that the school is a leading uh, uh, law school in the region, 
in Latvia and has also put Latvia on the world map. Thank you for this hard work, innovations, and uh, uh, patriotism for your school and the uh, work you have done so far. Thank you very much. That really is a uh, huge achievement. From the Ministry of point of view, of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs point of view, of course, you are our best uh, friends. Um, you are our uh, closest uh, associates in uh, also helping to shape yeah. Latvian foreign policy objectives and to achieve them uh, through providing the uh, special programs for our, Europe, uh, for our Eastern Partnership countries, for the countries of Central Asia, uh, as, as well as, as the southern neighbors. Uh, the uh, other programs which you also um, offer for the students helps us uh, to share the, uh, share the uh, experience and knowledge which uh, Latvia has acquired through the different uh, uh, transition periods. And that additionally uh, assists in um, helping the people in different parts of the world to put forward uh, the ideas and thoughts which they have acquired here in, in the Riga School of uh, Law. The, um, it's, all, it's also possible, of course, with the help of our donor countries, donor partnerships, uh, donor countries and, and, and sponsors. And I have to mention uh, the United States of America, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Netherlands, Luxembourg, who on different stages with different programs have hugely assisted us in Latvia, the school, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to achieve the goals and results which you have uh, so far um, achieved. The, um, Combining law and diplomacy in one comprehensive bachelor program is additional field which uh, helps also for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to find and to see a new, um, new diplomats, future diplomats in our, in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, when I joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs a long time ago in, in 1990, uh, there was, uh, and I was a head of the legal department uh, at that time, there was a discussion with our um, colleagues and, and, and great help came from the Switzerland. And Swiss, uh, head of the legal department, Swiss Foreign Ministry of Affairs, he was uh, assisting us in finding lawyers for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we had difficulties in, in how can we combine diplomacy and the uh, legal expertise, how can we um, try to get more uh, lawyers to, to work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? And the answer was very, very, very simple. There is uh, a possibility of uh, rotation. At some stage, the lawyer working, working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it's at a uh, future uh, stage, uh, he or she moves out and gains additional expertise. Uh, specializes in, in, in the uh, fields they are interested in, uh, receives the practical experience, and then again returns back into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That was a um, simple and very, um, really very simple scheme which we thought, oh yes, let's do that. Unfortunately, it doesn't, uh, didn't work so well and is still under the question mark of, one of the reasons could be the uh, differences in, in, in um, salaries and in the um, um, money which you are receiving in the practical field and in, in the, in the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But at the same stage, if you are able to um, change the um, course of your country, assist in changing the course of your country through the policy, uh, through the work and, uh, uh, on the policy matters within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that could be much more rewarding rather than to look into the, what exactly is uh, the salary side of the uh, payment. So there should be some sort of uh, challenge into uh, possibility to be a part of history in changing and uh, um, uh, giving it uh, he, her or her um, additional thoughts for the uh, policy change. That is one of the, uh, our hope that we could have more inter interchange between the faculty uh, of law, uh, lawyers in different uh, fields and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The same goes into the uh, issue of the expertise. We do have um, great cooperation with the uh, Graduate School of Law in 
in the field of effects of expertise. A lot of graduates from the school and professors are participating um, in different seminars, in uh, giving additional thoughts uh, and their uh, um, support to the problem-solving issues which we have as a challenge at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in the government as such. For that, we are thankful for the um, Riga Graduate School of Law, for this excellent cooperation which we have so far, and we do hope to enjoy in the future. Um, one thing which I, as a, as, um, a wish or as a, uh, a thought, would like to share is that lawyers are very conservative people. That's uh, quite clear. But the world is changing quite rapidly, and it's, um, the changes are happening so quick and so fast. So the lawyers, when they join the diplomacy, they have to have a much broader and wider um, view uh, on the issues which are on the table, which they have to uh, solve, which they have to think through. Um, when I was a young lawyer, some, one professor was telling to me that, oh, you don't need to know the civil code or criminal code by, by heart, but you have to know where to find the answer. In the modern world, uh, in a very turbulent world, there are so many uh, sources of information available today through so many different uh, vectors and angles and with a great and uh, really uh, persuading arguments uh, but how to navigate through all this information flow and to find the right answer is a challenge to everyone. It's not only to the lawyers or, or the students or the um, politicians, uh, governments, and uh, in the business world, uh, this for our future generations as well, for our kids. Um, in the world of fake news, in the world when there is difficult to um, believe that this is really the uh, correct and right uh, uh, source of information, you have to be very innovative. You have to try to find out um, different sources, compare them, and make your own judgment. To make your own judgment, even if you compare different sources, you have to have a good background of information uh, which has been given to you by professors, by the practitioners, uh, by your own experience, by reading um, different uh, um, articles, uh, journals, scientific uh, uh, magazines, as well as textbooks. Textbooks also are, today's textbooks tomorrow is, is not usable anymore. So which textbooks are we going to use? I know the lawyers are conservatives, you write once and it works for uh, years and years ahead. But if you combine your, uh, as a human, as a citizen of the society, and if you have to be active and the one which uh, uh, gives additional value to the society, not only taking from society, but giving back to the society which has um, helped you to grow up, then you have to have a really very substantial information uh, based on different sources, as I mentioned, as well and as your own view, own knowledge. And I wish you all to try to train yourself in trying to compare, to see where you can find the information and make your own decisions, uh, make your views clear, um, defend them, don't follow followers, uh, make your own decisions. And that's wherever you are, in any country, any part of the world, even being on vacations or on holidays and just enjoying life, this is the challenge of 21st century, especially at this particular case, the uh, information flow and its trustfulness. Once more, congratulations um, um, for 20th year anniversary. Um, again, thanks from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to all our donor countries, partners, uh, to the students and graduates uh, who still keep a good connection with the uh, school. I wish uh, a smooth sailing in future. And um, uh, we in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are always most uh, happy to see you as advisors, as uh, diplomats, as uh, just uh, good friends. Thank you very much.
Ambassador Penke provided an excellent bridge to our next session because uh, apparently we have suffered from fake news that the rector of the University of Latvia will be present here. Uh, well, uh, he was prepared to, to be here uh, this morning, but apparently something has happened. And um, uh, we will be uh, now uh, switching over to the uh, uh, keynote addresses. And um, uh, first uh, will be an address by a professor of Riga Graduate School of Law, Ineta Ziemela. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, dear students and the graduates, excellencies, um, it is indeed my pleasure today to congratulate all of us on the 20th anniversary of the Riga Graduate School of Law. Um, the fact that this school uh, does exist already for 20 years, uh, it is uh, in itself um, an achievement. And uh, I'm going to explain to you in my um, little lecture uh, why it is so. Um, the uh, Riga Graduate School of Law, after, uh, at that time, after uh, very serious uh, reflections um, and uh, some of the people who participated in these reflections are present here uh, in the audience, um, in the end took a shape uh, that already sort of indicated that the Graduate School of Law was going to represent uh, a new kind of uh, legal education in Latvia. I think probably at that time the whole magnitude of the idea was not very clear. And over the years uh, it has materialized more properly. Now, what is new about what the Riga Graduate School uh, of Law has managed to offer, is trying to offer, and will continue to offer? That is the fact that um, um, it is geared towards uh, the Europe, it is geared towards the world, and uh, it already uh, implies and requires that lawyers, in fact, are fluent in more languages than just a native language, that for lawyers who are conservative indeed, in fact, is a new, uh, uh, new dimension. Um, I will say that uh, modern legal education, and some of the um, guest uh, speakers already brought up uh, several reflections that will help me to, uh, to make my sort of, to present to you my vision of what the legal education should be like in the 21st century. But I will have two main propositions. Um, I'll say first that modern legal education today cannot stay within the national bounds. And I will say that uh, it cannot stay within the limits of legal discipline alone, uh, indeed. Um, I will explain uh, these two uh, propositions and I will make a projection of the two of them uh, onto the, uh, uh, what RGSL um, offers. Now, it was interesting that already the rector uh, referred back to the history. Now, you can approach these two propositions indeed uh, from a historical perspective. I mean, the methodology uh, which I am going to use is indeed from the past to the future, and you will see how that is going to look like. Now, as to the national bounds of the law, as we know, historically, the divide between national and international emerged primarily with the emergence of a modern state, which phenomena is only about 200 years old, at least looking from a European perspective. In Europe, a modern governance uh, within the states and their consolidation uh, in themselves accompanied the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. 
It is important to keep in mind how we have arrived at the paradigms that today govern our worldviews. The early legal, quote and unquote, philosophers such as Vittoria, Grotius, Emer de Vattel, and some others, throughout the centuries were building the concept of law, separating it from its assumed divine source, and placing it within the concept of what I call a mortal sovereign. Um, in the works of these philosophers, there was no divide between national and international. Um, the early philosophers talked about the laws of nations, uh, and at that time, before the modern state had arisen, the concept of nations, droit des gens, could cover the church, could cover the group of people, um, the kings and queens. So what we see that uh, it was already at that time, and I'm talking sort of late Middle Ages, the society was plural and horizontal. Now, um, we, today, when we recognize that the 21st century has provided us with yet again a plural society. So we live in a plural international community where the states are no longer the powerful and the influential actors. And those teaching law and finance, for example, at the RGSL, clearly deal with multinational companies. We have jurisprudence on these companies. Some of them are more influential than the, than the budget of the Republic of Latvia. So um, I think it is very useful to remember that the world has already been very plural in its nature. Um, that was the time, interestingly, that the philosophers that I mentioned conceived the law as natural law, as something that ought to, by the nature of various subjects, govern their behavior. Now, it was not until the Swiss jurist Vattel, in his writings in the 18th century, explained the positive law of nations, in other words, international law. And in fact, he was the first one to identify, if you search in his writings, the three sources of international law and their horizontal relationship. All of my students of international law know very well what I'm talking about. Parallelly, the idea of a sovereign and sovereignty was transforming politically and legally until that concept became, or that idea became a source of power to issue binding orders within a new kind of state uh, slowly emerging at that time. And what we see is that positive international law, that is the moment, became detached from the sovereign in the world of many sovereigns, many sovereign nations. And I would say that uh, we all know the history, uh, complex and often brutal events over these centuries led to the way we look at the concepts such as law, state, world order, and others today. And that is also something to keep in mind. 
uh, 18th and 19th century legal philosophers, and I should mention in particular Bentham and Austin, actively conceptualized domestic law and developed a more formal concept of law, which had with different nuances actually been a leading school of thought until now. Now, today, domestic and international law, fortunately or unfortunately, continues to have different explanations as concerns their validity and normativity. In a democratic state, the people is the sovereign and the law is to serve the interests of the people. However, put in such terms, we could as well be talking about the times leading to the Peace of Westphalia of 1648, because then too, the law served the interests of sovereigns, different sovereigns, the queens and the kings, and in fact it ended a 30-year war and was the basis of the process I mentioned already to you, leading to the formation of modern states. Now, around 1648, the sources of law indeed uh, changed. Previously, the source was divine. From now on, it was going to be the socially constructed sovereign whoever emerged into that position. The treaty for the first time ended uh, the wars and determined the territories within which only one sovereign had a valid claim. Sovereign territories were delimited by positive law. The de development has stayed with us even if it took centuries for the principle of territorial integrity and non-interference into the domestic affairs of the state to come into shape as we see it in the United Nations Charter. And in fact, it is these two principles that reciprocate what we know today as a divide between national and international. My professor, Philip Allott of Cambridge University, whom I have referred to on a periodic basis, uh, has argued that it all went wrong, that there shouldn't have been the world of states, and the division between national and international law should not have actually taken place. Um, instead, there was a chance around the Peace of Westphalia to have a different course of history. Allard is not praising Vattel for his work, which validated the formal concept of law. Um, Allard's criticism is worse file of reflection. That type of reflection requires a good grasp of history. Why is it necessary uh, to reflect on Allard's criticism of uh, Vattel uh, today? It is because today, in the context of globalized world, we are looking for the ways to deal with the situation where the state boundaries are no longer what they used to be. They have indeed become yet again transparent, differently than centuries ago, but they are very transparent. European integration shows that the world of many inwards-looking states is not sufficient to address the global needs and challenges. In terms of legal and political thought, we nevertheless continue dancing around what I call the sovereignty paradox. There is a moment I want to give you a citation on what is a sovereignty paradox, because this unfortunately continues framing the minds of the lawyers and the uh, frame gives a frame for legal education. And uh, this commentator has paraphrased Kelsen, naturally speaking of positive law. 
The constitutional order of a sovereign state is the highest underived legal authority about which there can be no higher authority that is its source of validity, regulating and determining its conduct. Sovereignty as supremacy is a negative concept. Accordingly, international law is an autonomous legal system that authorizes and obligates states must be denied on the sovereignty thesis. But of course, because sovereignty means absolute power within a community, it means absolute independence externally, and it means full power as a legal person in international law. If that's the concept of sovereignty, we continue working with, international law is not possible. Supranational law, even less so. Of course, we all know the reality. The reality is that international law and supranational law are strong. They are uh, applied directly in many states. In fact, they are the basis for subjective rights for the individuals. They have an incredible influence also on the sovereign, and they do, in fact, limit the sovereign, even where the sovereign does not know about it or doesn't like it. So this is the sovereignty paradox, and we really, as a legal profession, need to deal with this dilemma. Um, I have argued already on several occasions that we need to reconceptualize the sovereignty concept in the globalized world that we live in in the 21st century. Now, as far as legal education is concerned, international, European, and comparative law perspectives need to be integral parts of classical areas of so-called domestic law, learning, and research. Globalization, which has enhanced the plurality of actors, which do influence international and national legislative agendas. Just uh, let's follow the recent uh, meetings of the various parliaments with the Facebook uh, leader. This requires a different approach to legal education, which has been set during the 20th century along the lines uh, dictated by the main school of thought, namely legal positivism, divisions between the public law and private law, and many other divisions and separations. Now, I am sure that the leading universities have taken the course into a different direction, into a unifying direction of uh, the discipline. Um, in Eastern Europe, as far as uh, I have been able to observe, uh, we have still uh, quite a lot of uh, work uh, to do. Let me just give you an example how I picture um, such a, uh, a study, uh, studying one area of law. Let's take criminal law, uh, extremely important evidently for any law school uh, because uh, exercising um, um, uh, sovereignty by the state means also having an effective penal jurisdiction. Now today, when studying criminal law, I simply cannot picture that that part would not involve studying international criminal law, the statute of international criminal court, the jurisprudence of the ad hoc criminal tribunals, international human rights law, as well as common law standards of evidence. Now, these, studying these as separate subjects without making connections and seeing the influences and the overlaps and the harmonies no longer serve the 21st century society. So, uh, in other words, um, there, can no, there cannot be a national bound to law 
Now, how do we raise to this challenge? That's, of course, also the question for the Riga Graduate School of Law. I have naturally moved to the second proposition as to the bounds of the legal discipline. Um, I must say, I'm sure when Vattel was dealing with the world around him, did not really mean to provide for a very um, a narrow uh, concept of law, although uh, it actually has turned out to be narrow, it has turned out to be very positive. Um, and um, the, the fact really uh, remains that uh, lawyers tend to be very specialized in their um, uh, domain, whatever that domain may be. Um, I think at the same time, looking at the history sort of globally, the separation or the divorce of law from broader social studies into a separate discipline in a bigger scheme of things is a recent phenomenon. Um, the division of the legal uh, discipline into many smaller subdisciplines, in fact, is even more recent phenomena. And indeed, it has uh, uh, to do with the development of the modern state, particularly the 19th, 20th, 20th uh, century state, and with the growth of the complexity in human behavior. Now, I, did, I don't say that there was no legitimate purpose. We could probably find it. Um, there is today, uh, in free market economy, there is also what it seems a demand from market forces for more specialization in shorter time spent in acquiring education. And of course, for more specialization for the work for, uh, workforce. And I also dare say that the well-known Bologna model that we try to follow in different universities, in fact, has been majorly, I wouldn't say word, use the word lobby, but uh, it has been influenced by the demands of the, uh, of the, of the market uh, forces. Now, it has been probably characterized as a tension between um, quality and cost. That those who do uh, criticize come into this paradox, paradox of quality and cost. I think the, 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 the um, to me, this is a false tension. This is a false tension because quality in the end is cost effective, has to be. Of course, we have to define what the quality is. Now, historical perspective offers an interesting reflection on these separations into um, disciplines because on the other hand, what we see is that the 20th century has witnessed the return of interest towards what was called originally as interdisciplinarity, what we can call multidisciplinarity. I'm not going to specifically address uh, these concepts. What I'm interested in is the phenomena. Once we separate it and we continue to separate and subdivide, at the same time, the human mind is working and brings back, no, we need to see sort of the overlaps and influences between various disciplines. And that already started again, actually, in the 30s of the 20th century. Um, I would like to provide you with a very quotation from a very early uh, author on the whole idea of interdisciplinarity and where the problem of specialization lies. Previously, men could be divided simply into the learned and the ignorant, those more or less the one and those more or less the other. But your specialist cannot be brought in under either of these two categories. He is not learned, for he is formally ignorant of all that does not enter into his speciality. But neither is he ignorant, because he is scientist, 
a nose very well, his own tiny portion of the universe. We shall have to say that he is a learned ignoramus, which is a very serious matter, as it implies that he is a person who is ignorant, not in the fashion of the ignorant man, but with all the petulance of one who is learned in his own special line. In the United States, the interest of looking across to the other disciplines emerged with the particular force in the 60s and 70s uh, of the last century. I think in Europe we are still trying to understand what that might mean for legal education. And I would say there are the following problem areas that Regal Graduate School of Law cannot alone solve. We need a Minister of Education in the audience. <clears throat> now, you see, in order to be able to avoid becoming ignoramus, it is extremely important that the general curricula of the education, high school education, the, the school curricula, is really such that leads, that opens to university education. Where the university professors are either talking law and diplomacy or international law, do not have to quickly try to teach history, the world history. That um, happens still. So um, it is evident that at the university level, uh, the uh, market forces require, and I can definitely agree with that, for more uh, sort of the, the so-called lawyering courses. And that is a science in itself, how to, in fact, provide for lawyering courses. But you can only do that where you have the students already versed in various areas of social studies. Um, so we need to build already on, on so-called learned students and not uh, such students who are ignorant of the other areas uh, of social studies. I believe uh, that the question of the content and role of legal education in the 21st century has a paramount importance for all the reasons the previous speakers mentioned. I do not think we have asked it yet properly, nor do I think we have really started debated this question properly. The RGSL has moved into the direction of building uh, the, this, this new concept of legal education in various ways. Already the programs, uh, law and diplomacy, law and finance, the new program, program law and technology, in fact, is the way forwards, forward in the 21st century. However, the next step is to make sure that content of each course and especially the relationship between the courses within the interdisciplinary uh, programs in fact are in harmony and can advance the knowledge and the specialization within the broader uh, approach. Uh, to conclude, I think this is the right approach to proceed. This is a great experiment, in fact. <laughs> it's not easy, I, I actually know that. But um, it, is, uh, it has an incredible potential, what the school has started. And uh, I wish the school uh, receives all the support that it needs. Because in the region, in fact, to my knowledge, there is no other comparable uh, 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 
sort of universities, I think, which is trying to do what the school is trying to do. Now, with that, the program for the next 20 years is set for you. I congratulate you with that and thank you for your attention. RGSL is an internationalized school, you know, either by uh, faculty, by, by student body, by um, curriculum, uh, and it, it does create certain, certain challenges. But uh, we're not alone in, in this, and uh, uh, therefore it, it uh, would be very appropriate to perhaps listen to the experience of of similar schools that have you know similar profile and how they deal with that and what their outlook is and therefore very pleased to welcome uh, uh, Professor Tibor Taiti of the Central European University. Uh, okay, Labdin, Paldias. Uh, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that it makes sense to start by uh, uh, saying just a few words about the school and myself because that will also explain the things which I have tried to raise here because indeed, as uh, the rector said, the CU Central Eastern University is basically Central European University, CU in Budapest, is trying to do exactly or roughly the same thing as uh, this school uh, has been doing for the last 20 years up here in the Baltic Center. Uh, the difference is that we don't have undergraduate programs. We have just uh, LLMs and uh, SJD studies, but we have also exclusively international uh, student body from all over the world. Uh, and given the fact that we don't have undergraduate, bodies, uh, undergraduate students, we build on their knowledge. So whoever has a recognized basic law degree in their home country, they can apply for our, our uh, programs. We were, we were accredited uh, in 1993, 1994 academic year by the state of uh, uh, New York. And we are still existing at the moment. Um, the second thing what I'd like to say is that I would like to congratulate to you as well as some kind of sister or brother organization from Budapest. And uh, I, I, I wish you not only the next successful 20 years, but the next successful 200 years Though I will not be in a position, presumably, to uh, join you for that uh, anniversary meeting, but my spirit will be here. Uh, and the third thing, what I wanted to say, uh, the gist of what I would like to say here, and basically the experience of my roughly 20 years of teaching at this uh, university, is I do think, I, have, I, I strongly think that uh, you, law schools of this type are needed. Uh, Actually, the more we are moving into the 20th century, these types of schools are even more needed uh, because, uh, well, actually, not just, you know, the, the traditional traits, the traditional slogans, you know, that we live in the age of globalization and things like that, that's all true, whether you like it or not. Um, I teach also at the China EU School of Law, which was established by the European Union, and I delivered my bankruptcy course uh, for the sixth year last December. So I can tell you on the basis also of what, have, what I have seen in China, you know, that you know, during these uh, six, seven, ten years, you know, basically unimaginable un things have changed in China. And actually you will see that what I saw is that in the beginning actually the Chinese law students, you know, they were, uh, let's put it that with the tradition, on the level of a traditional Central European law students at the beginning of the 1990s. When I, wa I was, I became an LLM student at CU and was first exposed to Anglo-Saxon law, case method, Socratic method, and things like that. That was six years ago. Today, I can tell you that the average or the best, the cream of Chinese students is radically different. The law is changing also fast in China, and I, I dare say, this is also one point which I, I think it makes sense to, make, uh, to add, that we can expect that in the future, in the not so distant future, it's not going to be only the United States, European Union, who is uh, putting down you know, new things uh, as far as jurisprudence is concerned on the table, but the Chinese will do that as well. 
especially in the fields of big data. So everything that is linked exactly to technology. So uh, be prepared for that. Uh, the, the next thing or uh, introduction to me is that actually uh, I used to be a professor at this school, at this school uh, uh, and I am the chair of the International Business Law Program. But before that, I spent roughly 10 years as a corporate counsel in a company you will see which was very heavily uh, international oriented and was exposed in practice to you know, need of knowing foreign law. I will give you immediately a, a thing. And the third thing uh, I think, I, I think uh, it's, it makes sense to mention is my uh, experience in China. Um, I, be, I was asked to talk about something that is more linked to you know, teachers, professors. So I have proposed this topic, the impact of technology on the accessibility and the contents of law. And basically, the truth is that you can, it's very hard to uh, limit and say, you know, this is just, you know, what, what concerns teaching. You know, teaching does not exist solely for the sake of itself. We teach because there are needs. And in other words, when you're teaching, you need to take into account also what are the needs of the market, which was already mentioned here. Um, and therefore, we have to adjust also how to teach, what to teach, and things like that. Um, um, so I, basically, I, divide, I will divide my uh, presentation into three uh, eras, let's put it that way. I will deal with basically what my, with my life experiences. So basically, I graduated in 1986. That was still, you know, end of socialism, something of that sort. No mobile phones, no internet. Uh, I call it the hard copy era, where law was basically in books. Uh, in many countries, including also Central and Eastern Europe, you know, you were lucky if you even had textbooks. You, this may be funny to you today, but in those days, basically, you, there was a lack even of basic textbooks of, uh, related to local law, not, not necessarily international one. Things have changed to a certain extent. This problem still exists. So anyway, hard copy era. Then I will skip to uh, the end of the 1990s, which is basically the uh, arrival of internet. And how did internet change things? And finally, the third, and I call it the internet-based era. And finally, the uh, present age. Some people call it the digitalization age. I think that we should move faster because Actually, what we are living or facing today, it's not really the uh, digitalization, but rather the uh, algorithmization of life and also, you know, the challenge is what is going to happen with law and also the, the impact and appearance of artificial and intelligence in our lives and also including law and legal education. Okay. So focus on on access to foreign sources of law, but not just that. I hope that I will give you some uh, interesting information based on my own experiences, based on our research, books published, and things like that. Okay, so access to foreign law, hard copy era. And let me uh, refresh you or tell you a story. Sometimes uh, the students like if you tell some life stories, your own experiences, because, because they are pretty telling. And one of the stories from my life is exactly this one. My first encounter with US products liability law and punitive damages. I do not know whether you have heard about punitive damages or not. I do think that if you have not heard about them, that's a mistake. Today, you cannot afford that, especially if you would like to do business with the United States. Uh, products liability law, it's a new area of law, appeared also in, uh, it was introduced in the European Union somewhere in the 1990s, but the truth is that uh, to simplify things, uh, Europe has not really, pro European products liability law has not become as uh, fearful as the US one. Okay, and let me start with this one because the story goes back to this machine which is called late in English. I checked it in the uh, Latvian, it's uh, Virpa. Uh, in Ru I, given the fact that afterwards I got a job with this company, I had to learn that in Russian this is Stokanistanok, in German this is Drehmaschine, in Italian it's Torno, in Serbokrat it's Strug, in Romanian it's Strung. And this is the, 
uh, uh, talking about interdisciplinarity. So I got a job first as a corporate counsel with a company, the biggest market of which was essentially the United States. And we are talking about the 1980s, okay? And I can tell you that in those days, basically, in the company which had roughly 2,000 uh, 2, employees, a pretty strong export import department, very good economists, engineers, nobody had a clue about product slavery law uh, and especially punitive damages. Well, anyway, in 1986, I was finished, that was my last year, May, June, and one of the professors actually who had a Harvard law, Tibor Varady, famous arbitrator, he wanted to, you know, expose us to the challenges of foreign law, that, you know, the same idea what we are talking about today, that, you know, in the age is coming where you cannot believe anymore but knowing, only, knowing only your own local law. And he told actually the story of this company where I got a job afterwards and I got basically uh, access to the files, documents of the concrete case. And he said to us that, well, you know, people, this is a machine. This is a uh, lathe which, with which you are basically cutting metal. Uh, that spindle, you know, is rotating at, you know, a few thousand RPMs. And the important thing is that this is a dangerous machine. So in other words, it's very easy to, you know, cut your finger, hand, or uh, even to die if you make a major mistake. Like, for example, if you have long hair and it catches, then you're done. So anyway, the point is that this machine, nobody knew this thing. Uh, according to U.S. product slavery law, is inherently a ex very, very dangerous animal. Okay. So in other words, if you would like to sell something of this sort on the American market, then you have to be very, very cautious and aware of the existence of product slavery law and especially punitive damages. And the professor told us the story about that this company, which is producing this and had exported this machine to the United States, and somewhere in Omaha, in one small workshop, the machine basically caught the palm of one of the machine operator, and then the uh, following suit followed. This is exactly from the uh, files of the case, as you may see. So basically, they sued two million five hundred thousand dollars as compensatory damages and plus $5 million as punitive damages, plus interest, costs, et cetera. Okay, so this was the story. Just the professor wanted to expose us, you know, that while you have something, he knew that, you know, you are finishing the law school, you have not even heard about it, and he guessed that basically nobody even may imagine that something of this sort may exist. So he told this story, and you see the red part, my generation students, we did not believe that this, the dam damages could be so high. And basically, in the break, and even raising the questions, commentary, the professor, we said, no, no, this cannot be. You know, this, there must be some bribery. You know, they, somebody sold something because that was pretty uh, typical for the socialist times, unfortunately, in those days. But actually, afterwards, I got hold of the documents, and these are, ex these are the exact data. So this was the claim exactly. And I can tell you that eventually after a few years, actually there was an out-of-court settlement and we paid uh, uh, less than two million dollars, not us, but together with the U.S. Uh, distributors. But, but the point what I wanted to say, it's not only that we, the students, we did not believe because we had no clue. We were not exposed to foreign law at all. In our foreign law, you know, damages were, you know, and even today, irrespective of the fact that in Europe generally there is a trend that the amount of damages has increased by now, but it was pretty low. Uh, and what is more important is that uh, nobody really knew in the country itself, you know, that you have this risk. And if you don't know a risk, a risk which is presented by law, it means that you cannot create a strategy how to defend yourself against that legal risk, okay? So in other words, in those days, simply these machines were shipped to the United States without anybody thinking about what may happen and what should be taken. Okay, today, check it. Uh, I mean, this may be funny today in the age of technology, you just Google it, punitive damages, and immediately, immediately you will get a list of, you know, many, many documents, court cases where you can, you know, end up in basically two seconds, check and double check that these are real things. So 
These are serious things. And basically, the simple lesson is that if you would like to do business in the United States, then you have to reckon with this, okay? You either have some kind of a strategy if you're selling something hazardous, risky, uh, then either provide for insurance or some other types of uh, legal protections or don't do business with the United States, okay? Okay, now, this was the hard copy era, okay? And just think, I'm just giving you one insight. So, comparing today, comparing those days, so clearly, access to foreign law was a huge problem. In those days, basically, in the hard copy, paper-based world, the possibility to, to learn about foreign law was, you know, to turn to a uh, foreign law firm, experts, you have to pay a lot. Uh, second, you may turn to your uh, diplomatic consulates or, or, or uh, somebody in your uh, in, in the uh, knowledgeable, allegedly, in the ministries, or you may turn to the, you might have turned also to the um, chambers of commerce. But again, that, you know, that took time, you know, months. And if you got an opinion from a foreign law firm, the foreign law firm knew how to maximally protect themselves against any kind of risks. So you got some opinion which, you know, gave you some insight into certain things, but it was not necessarily sufficient to make appropriate decisions. Things, things are today slightly different, but I don't really want to suggest that today there is no need for getting a, uh, uh, additional information, opinion from former law firms or experts finding the law. Even today, that's an issue. So don't really misunderstand me. That's not my message. Okay. Now, so as I said, we got problems, costs, how to get it, and even if you got the information, there was an issue, what can you really do? How useful those information were? Plus, you had the problems which I think still exist, high level of paracalism, paracalism. Uh, 1986, you know, European Union was basically western part of the world, nobody really talked about in uh, uh, Europe or Hungary, Yugoslavia, about these things. All right, now, and then let's move to the internet age. You already know much more about these things. Um, and here is our, just, I think, the main uh, stages of development, as you may see. Uh, and here I'm referring to the periods of, of, of the still leading fee-based databases, like uh, Westlaw, LexisNexis, Hain Online, et cetera. Um, I uh, graduated, I uh, earned my LM degree in 1993. And I wrote a thesis on position in product slide with it exactly because of this case. And I remembered, you know, that I basically, I had one book and a, a few articles, a few cases, and that was it. So basically, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that that thesis was a bad piece of writing, but, you know, uh, when my students ask me, I will simply say that you have to accept and you have to realize that in those days you had access to just a few sources and that, that inherently had effect on the quality of, the of your thesis or, or your uh, writings. Now, and anyway, then internet came and uh, these are the main, most important uh, developments uh, to be absolutely uh, complete. Lexis actually launched, began somewhere in 1973, but as you may see, this was a service very limited because you had to dial through telephone. And again, you know, you may imagine, imagine you know, how much information, how much cases and writing she could have uh, gotten through that. So the appearance of internet began really to change things, 1997, uh, and more important in 1970, sorry, uh, yeah, 19, that's 1997, 1998, I'm sorry, there's a mistake. When basically, uh, Westlaw began to look like, as it looks like, look like today. Uh, but still, at the beginning of the 21st century, 2001, 2, still I remember, you know, it was still hard. Uh, you know, the search methods were still, you know, in the process of development. But there was a great, great uh, advancement because certainly, you know, instead of two or three articles, you had, you know, uh, 50, 100 articles, especially if you were dealing with writing covering U U.S. law. And as you may know today, it's not only these fee-based uh, databases which are used, but Google as well. So basically today, uh, you could say that there is a tendency or maybe even competition to, 
you know, upload more and more materials, and as it was stated by one of my previous speakers, that, that basically that has changed many things. Uh, yeah, and one of them which was mentioned here that in the past, in the hard, hard copy era, the problem was how to find what the law is on the basis of few written materials. And now, in the new age, you have a problem that you have so many, that so many types of materials available, basically not just through Westlaw, but Google, that the task of education and also of lawyers is something different, because now you have to learn how to pick the right sources. Okay, you have so many blocks, you have so many uh, industry publications, law firms, they are basically, this is a way how to attract clients. The problem with all the publications, as you may know, published by the industry representatives is that there is always, there should always be, you know, suspicion that they are kind of biased because they have certain interests, they have business interests, they have interests to present things, you know, from one angle. And even if they are not stating, you know, fake news or something fake about the quant content of the law, actually, you know, they don't necessarily tell, tell the bad sides of certain new things. Uh, and you as students and lawyers writing a thesis or a researching law, you have to learn how to do these things. And I think that it's not easy. Okay. Part of the story was also this open source movement, which basically I think could be added to appearance of databases. The open source idea was to make uh, basically first IT technology related things public available and then also scholarship. Um, you know, the changes which you can see now two days on the Google to a great extent was the product of this thing, but this open source idea has not materialized fully even today. So you still have uh, fee based uh, databases, you have still law reviews which you have to pay for, and things like that. Okay. Now, um, talking about those, age, uh, those days and uh, today, uh, part of the story is, and again we are talking about access to foreign law, I think that uh, part of the story is also what the various countries, jurisdictions, regions can do and what are their policies as far as access to law is concerned. And here I would like to say, mention that if you compare, this is my experience, you may absolutely freely disagree, but I was surprised, I, I, uh, one of my main jurisdictions is the United States, that basically, uh, I think that if you would like to research basically almost all materials, of, with the exception of the European Union materials or national laws, uh, most materials are available in the United States and about US law. And what is also striking that, you know, they tend to be normally very, very critical. Sometimes you read the American articles and you just stop as a European that, well, I mean, this is, this is already nuts, which is, uh, you don't necessarily see if you read, let's say, German literature or continental European literature. This is part of traditional culture, I don't really know. But these policy choices definitely, or approaches or perceptions of law are definitely there, talking about access to foreign law. Another similar issue is that the Central and Eastern European countries or emerging markets, they have interest to basically uh, make their laws available because this is a way also to compete for foreign investors, let's be clear. And I do think personally that this, this is a good approach not just making uh, uh, sources available in local languages, but also to translate them into English and maybe German, because this is useful for small jurisdictions to attract foreign investors. Moreover, I think that it will make sense even to publish and tra translate also more and more court cases, because I'm, I do think that life, economy, society changes so fast that simply uh, you cannot really match, catch up, and uh, basically the role of the courts inherently has already changed, increased, and this, this, this process will increase even in the, in the, in the future, uh, no matter what legal system we are talking about. Um, a, a few words about even China. Obviously, in case of China, uh, language is the, the key barrier, but actually even in China, you got more and more websites where they uh, publish in English language, not just laws, the text of statutes, but also the 
decisions or the positions of uh, the Supreme Court, which I named as some kind of um, idiosyncratic sources of law. Um, Ukraine, I don't know whether you know that, we published two books, the title which is the case of Central Eastern Europe, covering a number of countries from this region, and uh, it was by surprise that uh, somewhere in 2006 or 7 in Ukraine, basically, they passed the, passed the decision that all court decisions must be uploaded to a common website. Last year, I was in Kiev, had a uh, conference on uh, leasing, and basically everybody confirmed that this thing does work. So in other words, they are being uploaded. You have such developments as well. We are, don't forget we are talking about access to law, not necessarily just foreign, but also uh, local law. Okay, and now, Talking about already today and tomorrow, as I said, I'm not really certain whether we should talk about digital era or rather immediately skip to algorithms because the digitalization basically uh, uh, mean, means changing the nature. It's true that you know, things become more accessible. You can much e easily send materials via internet than you know, in uh, hard copy. But I do think and I suspect that the bigger changes will occur because of the appearance of algorithms and, and, and uh, new technologies like blockchain, where actually you have this problem that a problem of unknown unknowns, or more precisely known unknowns, meaning that we do know that blockchain technology is here. If you follow what is happening, everybody's just praising that, well, this will change everything. And actually, I read last week in the Financial Times that the first Blockchain-based letter of credit international transaction has been effectuated, and it does work. So basically, much less paperwork and basically much less time. So it has been tested. It's working. But we have many, many questions, so we don't really know what are the risks and problems the new technology will bring, not just to uh, law, but also uh, trade, finances, etc. And uh, maybe let me finish with this Chinese example that uh, just to show you that, you know, we think that we can predict things, but I think that the more technology will be uh, playing a role, the less will be in a position to predict what, what will happen. Um, I was also surprised to learn about very, this very new development in China. I do not know whether you heard about it, debt collection. Uh, in China as well, China has also become a pretty consumer-based society. Many, many uh, consumers, a large in indebtedness, uh, defaults, and basically the court system, enforcement system, does not really know what to do. And they introduced this thing, debt collection. Prohibition to purchase train or flight tickets, or uh, prohibition to enroll en your kids into you know, uh, elite schools, elite uh, kindergartens, uh, or even to... Uh, check in at hotels and uh, basically as a you know, if you don't pay your debt you will be the court will simply issue such a such an order and you may wonder how can this thing work it can work because of technology because in China you know uh, it's not easy to purchase a train ticket because everything is now already uh, online and it's very you cannot purchase a ticket unless you provide your identity and simply your name is in the just like in case of uh, airplanes in Europe, your name is in, in the database, you cannot purchase ticket, you cannot uh, get into hotels and things like that. So with this, I would like to stop. I hope that I have given you some interesting things. We are also trying to catch up in, uh, at uh, see you with these new developments. Uh, it's easy to say, it's hard to do. Okay, Paldies. I already mentioned that uh, we have a guardian angel, but um, RGSL also has an older, bigger brother, uh, and that is University of Latvia, and I'm uh, very happy to see rector of the University of Latvia here in the audience, and uh, this is Professor Ingrid Smojnex. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, dear guests, colleagues, excellences, uh, esteemed professors and uh, dear students. Uh, you know, 
I had uh, such a luck to be late today, so I had also the opportunity to hear the wonderful talks given by your colleagues uh, today and uh, enjoy uh, this intellectual uh, journey into past and future of law, of legal education, of um, interactions of uh, law, society, university, and uh, from the perspective of the University of Latvia, we have been together most of the lifetime of uh, RJSL. We have started to be involved, uh, if I am not mistaken, in 2006 after the school has already obtained a considerable piece of reputation in Latvian society, in, in Latvian higher education area. And in the same time, school faced uh, really hard times at that moment because after being bred uh, in under the umbrella of uh, Swedish uh, agreement between the Swedish agreement between Swedish and Latvian governments, uh, after an era of uh, having uh, very generous support from Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, after fulfilling its mission to prepare the Latvian law specialists for the accession period into European Union, school suddenly faced very such harsh uh, climate of uh, developing market economy, still in early 2000s, uh, already in uh, the framework of uh, the European Union, but still very much in the process of understanding, adaptation, how this really works, how the rule of law has to be introduced and executed, and uh, how uh, this uh, rather nasty competition between various private law schools, various private programs can be uh, survived, still pertaining uh, uh, the high standards and uh, serious international exposure, which has been characteristic for the first years of the school's development and which has been so uh, supported not only by the governments but also by the Open Society Foundation and uh, by Wallenberg Foundation and so on and so on. So the situation changed rapidly and when the university was asked to take part in the new formation, new uh, institutional uh, model of the school, our first uh, feeling that uh, was that it will create uh, a huge tension within the university itself, that it will create the problems uh, how to uh, how to coordinate, how to concert the uh, established system of legal education at the university, which was more or less nationally oriented, and uh, the model of school, which has always had uh, the international dimension prevailing, uh, also uh, international human rights, international constitutional rights as under as the uh, core core subjects of uh, the teaching in school. And our immediate understanding was that we have to keep our legal schools separately. So 
those two programs, those two concepts are mutually supporting, but they are, cannot be brought under one umbrella, under one uh, institutional body like the University of Latvia, because um, they can be synergistic, but uh, taken under one institutional roof, they would, uh, especially this, which was the smaller one, and which had more international-oriented uh, agenda, would be, uh, if not uh, completely the world, but it, it would be <laughs> at least uh, undergo some serious uh, and not always favorable changes. And that was the decision of that time's rectors of the university, Professor Lotz, with our participation with the man uh, management of the university, together with the Ministry of Education and Science, to take part in future development of school, but keep the school as a separate entity with its established agenda and with uh, possibilities to develop to new, mostly internationally oriented uh, topics of law, of business. And this has been uh, also implemented by starting new programs, by also finding I would say, innovative ways of uh, handling uh, financial problems of the school. And in the end effect, uh, we can say that the crisis, which was, to my understanding, to my uh, memories, uh, the most serious in the period of time when the uh, debt to school has to be paid back, and also general crisis of financial and economical crisis hit Latvia so badly as uh, only few of our neighboring countries in 2008-2009, we jointly managed to bring school back on track, to develop and to start new programs, and uh, in the 20th anniversary, we can say that school has a solid foundation for further developments. You have new ideas, you have new uh, programs in your portfolio. In the same time, I see again that the initial concept of having graduate school has to be revitalized again, because uh, those challenges the previous speakers were addressing of having very specific problems handled in international and national law, like uh, data security, cyber uh, security regulations, like technologies, starting with uh, not only lights, but also drones and, and all those other things which seem to be so fancy and at the same time so nasty damages creating. So this is not the subject of uh, basic education. This is subject of specialization. This is subject of even blended education where uh, the legal aspect has been or is addressed by the specialist already having background in probably ICT or in engineering or in biology. And um, we, to our understanding, will not compete for being uh, uh, state prosecutors or state or barristers at the 
uh, the legal system in Latvia. It's not the purpose of school. The school, to my understanding, has been on the cutting edge, on the frontiers of the developing legal topics, legal science. It has to be the place where uh, the interactions with universities and other leading business schools in Latvia, like our beloved neighbors, SSC Riga, or Riga Business School, can develop into really new type of specialists, new type of internationally acting uh, specialists on the borderlines of law and very other, many other rapidly developing fields of knowledge in society. And um, when very recently, one of the leading Microsoft uh, uh, managers from Redmond visited us at the university, I was surprised enough to learn that by his original education, he is a heart surgeon somehow moved into this virtual reality, which becomes more and more important for surgery. And I really believe that uh, in uh, near future, not only surgeons will be specialists in ICT or law, specialists will be spe uh, needed for development of uh, data security, but our new technologies, new algorithms will bring us to the situation that uh, the ICT specialists will be surgeons and uh, law specialists will be involved in creating uh, new uh, development plans for ecosystems or territorial planning and this shows, uh, to my understanding, the upcoming new wave of economy and technology era where this uh, syncretic, holistic approach to society, to knowledge, to economy will become more and more important. And in this way, the universities and the higher education institutions capable of being international, pursuing international networking, pursuing international research will be the most asked and most effective tools of the development of our society. And as usually on birthdays it is good tradition to bring some small presents, trying to be also, trying to pro provide some symbolic meaning to those presents. I would like to uh, present RGSL, this ceramic plate, which has a sort of symbolic uh, representation of university oak tree parts, which says that uh, the University of Latvia will always be a reliable, solid basis for the fruits and candies <laughs> <laughs> which will, brought, will be brought to school and which will make our joint life and development even more uh, enjoyable and successful. So, all the best. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as the older brother said, uh, it's time for fruits and candies. Uh, we don't, uh, no, we don't serve fruit uh, right now, but we will have a 10-minute candy time and, and tea time, so don't go away because we still have uh, 
uh, one keynote speech and a discussion. So that will be a 10 minute break. So and candies are served right uh, on, on this table. Thank you.
do you have uh, this uh, remote control? Or do you, do you need it? Good. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, may I uh, have your attention, please? And uh, may I ask you to return to your seats as we will be resuming our conference. And uh, we, have, uh, we have two, two activities uh, after this uh, break. So uh, the first is uh, speech, and the second one a, um, a brief panel discussion, uh, and um, I, um, I'm really thrilled to give floor to uh, a long-standing friend of the Re uh, Graduate School of Law, uh, who also somehow happens to be uh, with the uh, European Court of Justice. Uh, and that is uh, our honorary professor, uh, Eleanor Sharpston. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. As you, as you so nicely put it, I am uh, at the moment on loan to the court in Luxembourg. Uh, it is a very great pleasure, however, to be back here in Riga and as your Honorary Professor, something I'm very honoured by. You're the only people who've been kind enough to give me that title. My home university hasn't done that. So as somebody whom you have given that honour to, it is, of course, a great pleasure for me to be here for this birthday party. Although I didn't come with a plate. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> now, my challenge is going to be to try to show how what I want to talk about actually relates in the slightest to what we've been hearing so far. Uh, but I'm going to suggest to you that it does, because when we talk about litigating before the Court of Justice of the European Union, it is necessary at once to show the traditional skills of the lawyer and also to show an openness of mind which links across very nicely with what we've been hearing about in terms of interdisciplinary work, looking at how law combines with technology, combines with diplomacy, and, and so on. So let me make a bold statement to start with has the advantage of being a short sentence, which I love, in English anyway. Lawyers litigate, full stop. Sooner or later, most lawyers do in fact find they are litigating. Even lawyers whose professional practice is mainly advisory work, who don't really sort of fancy themselves in the brawl of the courtroom. Sooner or later, ladies and gentlemen, sooner or later, there's the deal that goes bad. Or there is the unexpected investigation of your client by the authorities. And that results in an adverse decision, perhaps a financial sanction as well, and that may need to be challenged on the client's behalf. And if the surrounding circumstances involve the application of EU law, and that's often the case, you know, if you look under the national law and you scratch a bit, you find there were some EU law provisions which, in fact, underpin the law that is being applied. Well, in those circumstances, the litigation journey that the lawyer will be taking on behalf of the client may, at some stage, pass through Luxembourg, which is where the Court of Justice of the European Union is based. And when I say Court of Justice of the European Union, we're, we now have a nomenclature problem because we have an institution called the Court of Justice of the European Union. But within that institution, we have two jurisdictions. We have, very confusingly, the Court of Justice of the European Union. Who did that? I mean, it should have a different name. The Court, the Court of Justice, let's call it. In English, we tend to call it the ECJ, which is clear, but actually has no source whatsoever in the treaties. 
We have the Court of Justice and we have what used to be called the Court of First Instance, which seemed perfectly logical because it was the court which was below the Court of Justice. But it got rechristened and it became, in English, the General Court. So let's look very, very briefly at how the lawyer is going to find him or herself in front of either of those courts. Court of Justice, first of all, then. Well, unless you're doing government work, you will probably meet the Court of Justice through the reference procedure under Article 267 TFEU. That is, unless you have an appeal from the General Court, but that's kind of obvious, isn't it? So, the parameters to that reference procedure, well, first of all, rather disconcertingly, for most lawyers anyway, you're not really going to be doing anything at all with the facts. The facts are the facts that were found by the National Court. You may think the National Court got it wrong. You may think the National Court should have found lots of other facts which would help your client, but you are stuck with the facts as recorded in the order for reference. You can certainly hint to the court that there may be some other matters that will need to be looked at once the case goes back to the National Court, but you cannot invite the Court of Justice to find lots of facts. And for that reason, you're not doing any of the things that lawyers do as their bread and butter in a National Court. You're not adducing evidence, you're not examining witnesses, spoken like a true common lawyer, you know, you're not doing any of that. The order for reference is what frames the proceedings. Having said that, the court has a slight habit of sometimes going a bit wider. Now, the good news, if you're a national lawyer and you're ambitious, is that usually, usually, really, really usually, if there's a case in the national court and the national judge makes a reference and there is a stage in the case which therefore takes place before the court in Luxembourg, the Court of Justice, you, the national lawyer, get to follow the case. And this is great and it looks wonderful on your CV, uh, but it also means that many, many people who are pleading in front of the Court of Justice are first-timers. They haven't done it before. And for some of them, indeed, it may be the one and only time that they plead in front of the court in which I serve. Now, we don't expect you to do it blind. There are some rules of procedure. There's even some guidance for counsel, as well as the guidance for national courts, which are sitting there on the website. And you do well to read that, because if you read it, you discover, uh, and this, uh, this is something which disconcerts many lawyers, you discover that, for example, there are very strict time limits for lodging written observations. We're not nice and cuddly, we're not flexible. If you have written observations to put in front of the court, you have a period of two months and ten days from the moment when the order for reference was notified to you. You may wonder why the ten days. I have to tell you it is one of the splendid, splendid illogicalities, ridiculous illogicalities of the system. That in the old days there used to be different distances that were added on to those two months to reflect the different distances from Luxembourg that the lawyer might be and therefore the time that it would take, well, an old-fashioned letter or indeed perhaps a carrier pigeon to get from where the lawyer was to Luxembourg. And then, as our previous speaker was explaining, you know, technology moves on. Now, of course, there were, there were fax machines, first of all, great innovation. And, and then there was email, gosh. And so the, you know, the 10 days actually is completely ridiculous. You do not need a 10-day extension. But we were hearing before that lawyers are conservative people, and certainly the way we all work, most of the work gets done in those 10 days. Because you know there's two months, and that's great, but you need to consult with the client. If you're doing government work, you need to liaise with the government. 
And somehow, inevitably, inexorably, you get to the end of the two months and you still haven't got the text. And then you go into the 10-day period and finally, on the last day of the 10 days, you know, you manage to get the facts off and then you send the written text to confirm it and it's all fine. And so when we tried, we, the court, tried to abolish the 10 days, there was a howl of protest from lawyers representing member states, you can't do that, you mustn't do that. We don't care that it's illogical to have those 10 days in there. We need the 10 days. So you have, ladies and gentlemen, two months and 10 days, but you don't have 11 days. Please be careful. Court of Justice, therefore, general type of action you will have will be the reference procedure under Article 267. In the general court, it isn't like that. In the general court, quintessentially, you are challenging an adverse decision. Now, that can be an adverse decision on a company client that has been being a little naughty with the competition rules. It might be something to do with a decision of the chemicals agency with reach. It might be, of course, that lovely subject which we're all passionate about, trademarks. Yes. Uh, it might be that you have a client who has found himself suspected, falsely of course, of some involvement in terrorist activities and he has had his assets frozen because his name has been put on the list and so on. You have a decision that you're challenging and as soon as you say decision challenging, you say, okay, some fairly obvious things that flow from that. Admissibility, is my, is my action going to be admissible? Does my client have like a stand eye to challenge this? There's Time limit, again a strict time limit for challenging the decision. Very importantly, it is the practitioner speaking to you. It's the whole issue of framing your case. As soon as you are taking the case to the court, you, in the way that you frame your challenge to that decision, you are setting the parameters of what the court is going to be looking at. And the court's not going to look at the case a different way up because halfway through, you suddenly realize that it might be nice to have brought in an extra point. You are framing it, and yet that first document will determine how the court is going to approach the issues and what it's going to look at. And again, okay, you will find the necessary material. It's sitting there in the rules of procedure, and it's sitting there on the website. That was all the same the sense I needed to say now about the differences between the two jurisdictions, because... What I'm going to move on to are points which are observations which I truly believe are common to both jurisdictions, both the General Court and the Court of Justice itself. So, dissecting my title, what's the same about litigating before these courts in Luxembourg? What's the same as what you're used to? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that what makes for good, sensible litigation is a constant. Doing the lawyer's job properly is actually, it's actually the same. You need to use your procedure efficiently and economically, and you need to take advantage of the procedure if there's something in there that can help you. You have to look after the client's interests, obviously. Helping the court and being respectful towards the court, by the way, are also in there. Because no, nobody is going to get the court on their side by projecting the case to the court in a way which is aggressive and disrespectful. I know we wear fancy robes and we sit up there on the bench, but actually we're human beings and... We try not to take a dislike to you, but some lawyers sometimes put a case in the way you think, I wish that client had not got that lawyer because I have got to disregard the way that lawyer is conducting the case and try to see if the lawyer, lawyer's client actually has a good case, which is not being assisted by the lawyer. So please, being helpful to the court, being respectful towards the court, are in there and they're important. Marshalling all the necessary and relevant information. Sounds crazy. Why am I saying this to you? Of course that's what you do if you're arguing a case. I wish I could say it of course happens in my court because it doesn't, 
people turn up every week and they haven't checked some very basic fact, which it is blindingly obvious that somebody, probably that tedious woman Sharpston as Advocate General, is going to ask them about. So marshal the necessary and relevant information, get it in, be prepared to answer the court's questions. Being reliable and trustworthy as counsel is, I think, very important if you're going to be a repeat customer of the court because you don't want to turn up arguing a case for your sixth client and have the thought saying to itself, oh, no, we've got so-and-so again. Yes, well, we will we'll disregard what they tell us and we'll have a look at the case and see if we can understand what's going on. Above all, I'm going to suggest, but this is true in the National Court as well, you need focused advocacy. This is not about picking up a machine gun and you know, firing bursts at random, hoping that with a bit of luck, one of the bullets is going to hit the target. Maybe with a helping hand from somebody in the court who sees that you almost got the target but not quite and sort of bends the bullet so that in fact it comes round. That is your job as counsel to make sure that the advocacy is focused and that it deals with the essential issues. All right, there had to be a second aspect of this, didn't there? That was what was similar. What about what's different? Well, I'm going to suggest that there are two aspects here that really one needs to focus on. One is the fact that the environment is a multilingual environment the other is that it's an environment of multiple legal cultures. Let's begin with the multilingualism. I think that litigating in a multilingual environment is a bit like repairing a watch wearing a pair of really thick gloves. You can do it. You can do it very successfully. But you really have to be aware of the fact that what you are generating in your head as the pleading and what is going to come out the far end through the linguistic frontier, over the frontier, through the linguistic transformation, are not necessarily the same thing. And hence my analogy with wearing gloves. There is an effect, first of all, on the written pleadings. There's an effect on the length, on making sure that they're clear, on what you use in annexes. Please be aware of a booby trap. In my court, annexes are not automatically translated. In a national court, if you have a pleading and you want to annex five very useful additional documents, you put them in and you say general point, and then you say see Annex 1. Please be aware, we have enough trouble managing to translate the core documents that are lodged. The translation services of the court at the moment, between what they're translating that's coming in, and they're translating that into our common working language, which, by the way, is French, not English, and then the documents that are translated out again into the 24 languages of the European Union, the global figure for translation every year at the moment is running at about 1,200,000 pages. That's an awful lot of translation. And we only keep it down to that by having very strict rules that we do not automatically translate everything that gets put in. So if you are producing a written pleading you have to flag up for the court that there is something absolutely vital at pages 27 to 29 of Annex 13. If you do that, there is some chance that somebody is going to dig that out. I'm going to let you into a little secret. How do we work around the fact that we don't translate anything, everything? Answer, if I know that there's something in Annex 13 that might be useful. And Annex 13 is in, yes, for example, Latvian. I will ask one of the lawyers who's working with me 
to go down the corridor and have a chat with a colleague who is working with the Latvian judge. And that chat will be that my lawyer says to the Latvian judge's lawyer, we're looking for point, this particular point. We think from the main pleading that there may be something in Annex 13 at these pages. Can we have a look at it together? Certainly, says the nice Latvian lawyer. And um, they sit down together with a highlighter pen. And if there is indeed in Annex 13 some passages that are useful, the Latvian colleague will mark in the margin with a highlighter pen, these are the core bits you actually need, and those bits will then be translated, but not 50 pages of Annex. Now, what I've described to you is a system which has no safety net, so if you would like us to look at Annex 13, please note you'd better tell us that that's where you should be looking. But at least the written pleadings are being translated by lawyer linguists who are dual qualified, who are both lawyers and linguists, and who do a very good job, right? That is the written pleadings. Now let's think about the effect on the oral advocacy. And that effect is very striking indeed. Let me tell you what happens quite often and what is almost entirely useless. Let us imagine a lawyer who hasn't been in the court before, so he's very excited at coming to this big, big moment in his professional career. He's also, of course, very nervous. And he realises that he put some material into the written pleadings, but lots of other things he needs to say. He is then disconcerted to be told by the court that he's only got 15 minutes. Never mind. I can write, I can write a speech that deals with all of this. And so he sits down and he constructs a very, very detailed, complex, complicated, in fact, effectively an, an additional written pleading. It's very elaborate. The sentence structure is Byzantine. And he knows that, in fact, that pleading can't be done in 15 minutes. You might do it in 25 minutes if you were going at a reasonable speed. Then he arrives in Luxembourg and he walks into the main courtroom because, you know, it was a big case. He looks round and it's a sort of double banked interpreter's booth. By now he is seriously panicking. And he is invited backstage by the president of the court just before the hearing. And there's a roll call. So the president will, will look and say, and... Uh, you are appearing on behalf of the plaintiff, Mr. whatever. Uh, you said you need 15 minutes. And this is where he makes his fatal mistake. He thinks, I can, I can get some brownie points off the court by, by saying I won't really need 15 minutes. I'll, I'll only need 10 minutes. So he says, I'll only need 10 minutes. Or, well, actually, perhaps 12, my lord, but I, I, I won't need 15 so we now have a text which would take 25 minutes, and he's just engaged that he was going to do it in 12 minutes. And everyone goes back outside, and the court comes in and sits, and the president beckons him forward. And at that stage, well, the first thing that usually happens is he doesn't adjust the microphone. So the microphone is up there somewhere, and as you can see, it's not much use up there. Because the interpreters can't hear you if you aren't speaking into the microphone. But the usher comes across and adjusts the microphone. And then he puts his head down into the script and he reads at lightning speed in a dead monotone with his eye on his watch or his iPhone, which he's put in front of him, to try to get this done within the time limit. And I have to tell you that the effect of this advocacy is very closely approaching zero. It makes no impact on anyone in the court who actually knows the language being spoken. And if you don't know the language that is being spoken, your only hope is the interpreters. Now, the interpreters are not mind readers. They are brilliant simultaneous interpreters. They are very, very good. By the way, they aren't lawyers. They are interpreters. And for many language combinations, 
the interpretation is not happening direct from the source language into the language that the judge or advocate general is listening to. And that is because there are certain language combinations which you are very unlikely to find an interpreter possessing unless he or she happens to have a family member with that language. I mean, let's take the example of Finnish into Greek, all right? As far as I know, none of our Greek interpreters speak Finnish, and that's because none of them have a Finnish mama. So what happens then is that the interpretation goes through a pivot language. And you can readily imagine that some of what is being said by the original speaker gets lost on the first leg of that interpretation, and the second part of what was being said gets lost on the second leg. I think I've, I think I've made the point. Let's move from there to the multiple legal cultures. And here I would simply say to you, beware the unspoken assumption. Let me explain what I mean by that. When we're talking national law to each other, we've come from the same legal culture, we've got the same background, we train the same way. We speak in shorthand. We discuss the core issue as we have defined it, but we discuss that against the background of a lot of shared matters, which, which we, we never bothered to visit. We have the shared common assumptions, and therefore what we do, you know, quasi-automatically, we only speak about what is contentious as between the parties. And that works fine, provided as an English common law lawyer, I'm talking with an English common law lawyer. It doesn't work fine as a guaranteed system if we're talking as between lawyers who are professional lawyers but who come from different traditions. If we come from different traditions, then unless you state the starting point and the premises, the surrounding premises clearly, you may find that you come unstuck. And this is what indeed does sometimes happen. We have discussions as between colleagues at the court. I might have a situation where a reporting judge whom I very often work with and, you know, very reasonable chap, no problem at all, and then suddenly on a particular case, I cannot understand what's got into him. You know, he's, for some reason he seems to have the entire case upside down and it's very unusual because he, you know, he's normally very reliable. When the, he's probably saying exactly the same about me, by the way. At least I hope he's saying I'm normally reliable. He's certainly saying the other bit. What usually happens, you, if you try to unpack what has gone wrong, what you find is that neither of you stated the surrounding assumptions. And what has in fact happened is that I have assumed white. His referendaire, the lawyer working with him, has assumed black. He has assumed gray. Oh, who knows, maybe yellow. In other words, we aren't starting from the same place. And it takes a lot of gentle effort, not to mention humility, to go back from that to get to a shared understanding of what the case is actually about so that you can then take it forward and deal with it. Now, I'm going to bring this to, to a close by making a statement and telling a short story. And it is a short story, I promise, those who are watching the time. I'm going to say that if you are an effective lit litigator before your national court, you can be equally effective before the Court of Justice and or the General Court. But in order <clears throat> to be effective, you do have to adjust to the environment in which you will be pleading. And in order to do that, you need this very same openness of mind that you need to be successful in doing interdisciplinary work. It's not magic, you need that openness of mind. Now, as a former 
English and an Irish barrister, I'm of course very proud of the good reputation that the bar has before the court. I'm going to finish with a cautionary tale. I hope it will also amuse. It was an occasion when I was working as a referendaire and as a lawyer working with a British member of the court, and I was in court. My judge I was working for, Sir Gordon Slynn, was the reporting judge, and a member of the English bar got it totally, totally wrong. The case, I'll protect the barrister by not identifying it by name, the case was about dairy quotas, about milk quotas. And the barrister had made the main pleading, there he is, resplendent, you know, wig, stiff collar, gown, very dignified. He's made his main pleading. And Sir Gordon Slynn, as usual, as customary for an English judge, is asking counsel some questions. And they're getting along beautifully. In fact, they've both forgotten that they're not in the High Court in London. <laughs> so Gordon is asking questions, and the barrister is answering. Yes, but Mr. Smith, you know, what about this? Well, my lord. And Gordon asks the final question, and the barrister gives an answer. And then, alas, the barrister says to himself, I, I can improve on that answer. I can, I, can, I can show how clever I am and just, just round it off nicely. And so having given the answer, which is that the same rule that applies to this should apply to that, he smiles ingratiatingly at Sir Gordon and he says, Indeed, my lord, one might say, my lord, that what is source for the goose is source for the gander, my lord. And, I mean, Gordon smiles, and everyone else is just sitting there with their earpiece, like so, and they're waiting for the interpretation of the final <laughs> submission. And they sit there, and they wait, and all the interpretation channels have fallen silent. <laughs> because all the interpreters are thinking furiously to themselves, what the hell was that? <laughs> and, and, and how do I interpret it? I mean, I, he was talking about milk a moment ago. Ah, what, we, what is this? The situation was saved, and saved brilliantly, by the French interpreter. Now, the French are sort of the senior partners in this game, you understand. And this was an extremely experienced interpreter. Years and years of faithful service. And she was not amused. <laughs> she leant forward. She punched the button on the microphone with a degree of viciousness that I have rarely seen. And in a voice that was about... 20 degrees below absolute zero. <laughs> she said, I'll give it you in French first and then in translation. She said, Il vient de raconter une blague sur la volaille. <laughs> he has just made a joke about poultry. <laughs> now, it was absolutely brilliant. Why? Well, because just like you, everyone laughed. And the, the barrister was was happy, you know, that's all fine. They enjoyed my they, they enjoyed my final submission. Jolly good, you know. And of course we were laughing at him. You know, what a prat. What what a complete idiot. How did he think that that was going to help the case in the least? So please, pas de blague sur la volée. Thank you. So in order not to be lost in translation, we will continue still in English. And um, I kindly ask uh, three keynote speakers, uh, Professor Ziemele, uh, Professor Sharpston, and Professor uh, Taiti to uh, uh, take these seats. And uh, we, will, um, uh, we will now switch to a more interactive part of, of this, uh, of this uh, discussion. And, uh, Um, 
As I'm supposed to moderate the discussion, I, I will stay here with this particular microphone and uh, then you will have two microphones uh, sort of floating around the, uh, uh, the room. So uh, please, uh, the, the floor is open for questions, comments, any, any interactions that uh, you may have in English though. Yeah, there is a question in the back. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, please, sorry. please use the microphone. <laughs> and, uh, I have a loud, loud uh, voice. <laughs> so I have a question to the professor, Mr. Professor. So you were talking about the IT and Mr. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> you are the only Mr. <laughs> So you were talking about uh, IT and law, uh, but uh, what about those IT law courses? Uh, do you have an opinion whether uh, people should take uh, them uh, regardless from which uh, branch they are? Uh, let's say if I am competition lawyer, should I invest in taking an IT law course? Should I invest my money? Should I invest my time? Well, your personal opinion. <laughs> I presume you have uh, some IT law courses in, in Budapest. Yeah, thank you very much for the for the for the excellent and very uh, challenging question. You know, uh, unfortunately, I'm not a future teller. So, um, uh, you know, my private opinion is that we have uh, many many challenges. It's not just only IT law. You got also courses on, you know, now data protection has also become an, an, an important new subject. Blockchain is coming, I'm pretty certain. Some people are already, you know, offering in Budapest at Corvinus University, which is economics, you have a, a competition of student groups on the possible uses of, black, of blockchain. Um, so my answer would be, or rather I, I would say, you know, that what I would do, the first thing is I would rather check, you know, who is teaching, what is teaching, how is teaching based, based on what. Because when you are at the inception, at the beginning of developing new subjects, then uh, you have many, many risks. You know, whether what will be conveyed to you, what is that you can learn in, in, in those courses. But I do think as well that uh, it's a wrong strategy to ignore all these, all these new developments. So this is what I can uh, tell you. Um, you know, I have not really mentioned, but if you uh, are interested in, in these topics, you already have certain books written by lawyers who, for example, Soskind, his book is about the end of lawyers. So basically he's predicting that in 20 years, you know, there will be no need for lawyers because uh, technology will replace us. And actually, you do have certain examples that these things are already happening, just you might have not really noticed about that. Again, talking about China, uh, and it's not just China, the uh, traffic fines, basically uh, in many countries, China, to China, China today basically you don't really have involvement of judges, simply you're just shot, there is a, uh, you, you were driving, you know, you crossed the speed limit, you will, there is a shot from you, and basically you just get your fine, uh, without any kind of a decision, without any kind of a involvement of any kind of a judge. So these things are already happening and because of that I do think that these things should not be uh, ignored. Whether it makes sense immediately to invest into taking a program or courses as a, somebody who's uh, specialized to competition law for example, I don't really know. But, uh, and, and maybe there are also differences between the specializations. I teach also various subjects related to finance, banking, bankruptcy, capital markets, and you may have heard about FinTech. Basically, that's the example of the combination of really technology and uh, finance. So basically, this is already happening. And uh, here things, are, things have much moved basically much more ahead advance much more than in, let's say, in the realms of competition law, if you ask for my judgment. Okay, so this is what I can tell them. I'm going to follow up a little bit on that, wearing my former hat as an academic, uh, as a fellow of King's College Cambridge. Uh, and 
what I think I would, the way I would be approaching it, actually we're, we're in a very similar, similar type of approach. I would begin by saying to myself, there is a lot of material out there. Do I really know that this is exactly the field that I'm going into? I mean, in other words, let's say, if during your law studies you've spent a summer internship with Hewlett Packard, and they're really fond of you, and you're thinking, yes, you know, I'll go back over other summers, and when I finish my professional qualifications, I'm going to go and try and work for Hewlett Packard as in-house counsel. Now, somewhere about there, you could think it made very good sense indeed to make sure that you knew more about technology, specifically in that field, because you can see an immediate direction for your career. But most people, most of the time, do not have something quite as precise and quite as focused as that in terms of knowing where they're going to go. And I'm going to give you, if you like, the background of my own 25 years as a practicing barrister, during which I became an instant expert on a bewildering variety of subjects because those were the subjects that the papers came in about. Uh, if you want a, a science example, I will tell you that at one moment I became a near world expert on the operation of piston pumps because we were talking about the delineation of the market in piston pumps in the context of a competition law case. Do I know much about piston pumps? Not really, I have to tell you. But I learnt enough about piston pumps by reading up on them by studying, by asking engineers, in order to do my job as a lawyer. And I suppose in a sense, I, you know, perhaps I'm being a bit old fashioned, but there is at least part of what you can do as a lawyer is by being open-minded and prepared to invest in specific learning and specific knowledge as and when it becomes clear that that is what you need in order to do the job properly for your client. Just to <clears throat> add, in fact, if you um, aim to become a judge, as a judge, you basically have to know everything. I mean, recently we had, um, I had a little exchange with a colleague of yours who said that after a difficult case on uh, medical issues, he told me in private, oh, I see, you got it. And I said, you know, we are by now used. I mean, you can come with just about any issue to us. We will solve it. So um, what I, I want to say is, um, and linking back to the whole issue of uh, scope and content of legal education in the 21st century, there is absolutely no limit to what you should be trying uh, to learn, in fact. and. Uh, I would say one should really not stop uh, with sort of the uh, legal sources, legal literature. One should definitely go uh, beyond. Um, in a way, uh, we are going back to, it's a, you know, the human race develops in, 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 in circles in a way. And we are back, uh, of course, in a completely new context where the human race was, where there were new these strong boundaries between the, the disciplines. So the more you know, the better lawyer you will be, uh, the more able you will be to actually make a submission in 10 minutes. And um, in fact, uh, as a judge putting my, my other hat, uh, the judges see all of that indeed, and I can just uh, second uh, what Advocate General was, uh, was saying also from the, from the side of the, of the bench. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, it was already touched upon beforehand, but could you please elaborate on how much do you believe that in the mid or the long term the legal professionals will be replaced by algorithms? Again, again I'm not, <laughs> I cannot really foretell the future. Uh, but the reason, uh, because of why I, I claim that it makes sense to you know, take this statement seriously is that there are other people who have uh, are more knowledgeable, not just knowledgeable, but rather you know, have access to um, uh, more advanced technologies, impact of technology, 
on the legal, legal education work of various kinds of legal services, they also claimed the same thing. Actually, I was at a conference on contract law, so nothing to do with technology, Florida, Miami, 2015. And uh, during the lunch, the Americans have this, uh, you know, this uh, habit of uh, you know, making people work even during lunch. So we were eating the sandwiches, and then a gentleman came to give a presentation. He had a, law, a Harvard law degree. He, he was some, I think, 50-some, so experience. He said that he uh, practiced uh, somewhere at a pretty prestigious, with a pretty prestigious law firm for 15 years. He got tired of all this, this, uh, that thing, then he, became, uh, he started teaching, and now he's teaching law. And his main claim was this, that basically people in 20, uh, 15, 20, 25, nobody really knows exactly, but there may not be no need for your job, for your, ex so that's it. I was also shocked, you know, uh, but ever since I'm uh, kind of paying attention to all, all, all the writings, books, articles, which, you know, talk about these things. And actually, the truth is that was in 2015 when I had not even heard about blockchain. And these days, you know, even in Budapest, you know, I, at my university, we had lasted just, I don't know, maybe 10 discussions just devoted to blockchain. And actually, I realized that, you know, there may be some truth in what this professor projected because blockchain essentially is about this intermediation. So basically kicking out those who are in between the clients. And today, essentially, it's the banks and the financial organizations who are kind of uh, most directly uh, affected, but I don't really see a reason why that may not really happen, you know, in a few years with legal professions. I mean, honestly, if you sort of reflect on, on this uh, more broadly, uh, we live in a society and we form the society the way the human mind sort of has come to conceive it. So um, your question on the future of legal profession, in a way, well, yes, if the whole society will decide uh, we don't really need that profession in this particular way or form, yes. But we should never really think that that will come from somewhere above and will be planted by technologies, etc. Uh, technologies are not going to replace a, uh, uh, a rational decision making in relation to the structures, the institutions, the rules that the society wants for itself. I think the, the big challenge really right now is, is the national boundaries. I mean, we see that in every area, you see that you sort of, you, it, it kind of, you know, puts a break on, 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 on several developments. So I think that's where the, the human mind should, uh, should concentrate. And of course, European Union as, as this for, uh, forefront runner in this, you know, and it's extremely interesting. And it concerns all of us how the idea of European, at least the European integration, um, will work. And honestly, I think we could all ask ourselves a question. Do you really want a dispute between you and your neighbor or between you and your employer or whichever other to be solved by a machine? Do you really want to replace a judge by a machine? Um, we have been discussing that. I will not tell in which court of the two I have um, continue serving. It is, but it is, it is the question, you know, do you want uh, that the examination of proportionality, because that's the key of the judicial work, is to be settled by an algorithm. I could think it may be possible. Could that? Probably. The um, Rolls Royce case uh, recently with the um, uh, British tax authorities, and they actually mm -hmm. employed an algorithm to find Rolls Royce on Right. Uh, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the on the issue. Indeed, it depends uh, how much mathematics is involved in a dispute. But where I talk about proportionality, where you have competing rights on equal basis, 
and both rights are equally important, there you simply cannot cater in all of the factors that may affect whether you favor in the end the one right over the other. So I, I take it that the um, very interesting uh, Chinese experience that you shared, I mean, those cases that are solved actually by machines, those I can perfectly see. And I also see that there is a rule for, um, a, a room for, for, for optimization, of course, you know, within the legal uh, world and practice. But then there will always be issues where disputes are uh, on, the, on the issues um, difficult and important for the society, for the society's development. There, do you really mean that we will now collectively decide that the machine should tell us? Hmm? Okay, here's the next question. All right, question. thank you very much. I wanted to respond to the first question, but apparently we raised our hands at the same time. Is this on? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Gabor Palashti, and I've been coming back to teach at RGSL here as a guest lecturer for 11 years by now, and teaching law primarily in Hungary for 22 years. And for 10 years, I was teaching students of computer engineering uh, the legal protection of computer software. That was a one semester course as we started. And I particularly wanted to focus on the copyright protection of computer software, which is the most important aspect. Uh, and in the first, um, the very first time I gave this course, and these were students of computer engineering in the five year program. So that is a master's level program undivided, no bachelor or master degrees, just a master degree before the Bologna system was introduced. And I planned it the way like there would be an introductory lecture about intellectual property law in general, and then we can focus on the copyright protection, and then in the end there would be one lecture devoted to patent protection of computer software. They should, they should be students of computer engineering, we should have some common language. Uh, and I was lecturing, lecturing, giving, it was very the Prussian way, not the Socratic method. And it turned out there was very little understanding. I thought I was, I was telling them about issues that they are supposed to have understood. I followed the, then it was the 91 per 2250 directive about legal protection of computer software dealing with reverse engineering, specific issues that are on the overlap between law and, and computer sciences. And very, very basic things were not understood, issues that I had assumed that there would be with them. Um, for example, when I spoke about the legal, the basic legal sources, some of them being international conventions, there is a Berna Convention dating back to the 19th century under the uh, WIPO, and then the EU di EC directive, then the national laws, and then somebody raised a question, what is the difference between an international convention and the domestic law? So we had to go back very much to the beginning. The next year, uh, I made it into a two semester course. The first semester was only about introduction to law, the very basics, what, how is a legal system composed? What are the different legal sources? Then a little bit about private law in general. Then we move on to intellectual property law. And I was hoping that in the second semester, I can now finally speak about reverse engineering and all the specifics of, of, um, of uh, the law that applies only to the legal protection of computer software. Could you we got through the keep first your remarks short, please? All right, okay, thanks. Um, and then somebody asked me in the second semester, what is the difference if I, as a computer engineer, establish my own enterprise, establish a partnership or a limited liability company? The outcome was if you, want to be, if you want to be mastered in both areas, you have to earn a full degree in both. And in some areas it works. For example, ma uh, lawyers who are involved in mal malpractice within the medical field quite often are doctors themselves, right? So, I mean, you cannot skip, you cannot shorten it down to gain the knowledge, which otherwise would require a full degree. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Raghav here. It's on. It's on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this question is for uh, Professor Taiti. Uh, you spoke about uh, China and uh, how they will be the jurisprudence, they could create jurisprudence in the future or the jurisprudence on certain things could come from China in the future. But my question is uh, based on you know, the experience that we've had. They have things like you know, social credit score have things that have restricted access in terms of firewall and things like that. When the internet came in the 90s, it came with the principle that everybody will have free access. 
So, you know, the jurisprudence that came from the US and subsequently was that everybody has access, we need to control access based on that, we have rights based on that. And now if jurisprudence is going to come from China, how do you feel this is going to affect jurisprudence in the West? Are we going to follow the same principles that they're saying, okay, we are all going to you know artificial intelligence is good, algorithms is good, but it's all going to be within the national borders. We're going to restrict it the way we see fit and we'll only develop things the way we, we see fit. Is that going to be the way that things are going to move forward? Is that what you feel? And I've got a quick suggestion from Ms. Sharpston. I think, uh, you know, I've, I'm going to be slightly audacious. I'm not experienced, but I think you should actually, you know, make this presentation into a pamphlet or a small book and send it to all the lawyers. And I think it will be useful for us. Thank you. I'll be happy to try to do that in between writing opinions. Since, I, since my colleagues have been rash enough to give me the microphone, I want just to come back very quickly to the uh, uh, earlier question in relation to algorithms replacing judges. Uh, and I want to come in very strongly behind the remarks that have just that have been made by the President's Constitutional Court because there are some things that algorithms are very good at doing and there are other things that they're less good at doing. And if you are an intelligent lawyer, you make maximum use of any way that technology can help you. And then there are places where you need judgment. One area where we see this very much at the court is in relation to legal translation. We've invested very heavily in software to try to help take some of the weight, take some of the burden in order to be able to deal with the volume of pages that needs translating. And that's really useful, but it's no substitute for the judgment and intelligence of a good legal translator who looks at an ambiguous phrase, the machine has suggested a way of translating it, and the translator looks at it and says, no, based on my knowledge of the legal system and my knowledge of language, that's not what the author was trying to write. And this is, you know, it's a, it's a well down the food chain from your example about proportionality. But it is essentially the same point. There are moments where you need the human mind to assess the material that's there and ascribe, and it's where it isn't mathematical, and it's where you can't assign numerical values easily, but you need to evaluate competing claims and, and, and make that work. I'll give you the really silly example with the English language. There is a word I do not use ever in an opinion. I'll now be Googled and be proved wrong, but I do not deliberately use it in an opinion. <laughs> and that word is the word quite. To me, as a na native English speaker, there are two totally different ways of using that word. I can say, I think it's quite likely to stay beautifully fine all day, meaning it's reasonably likely. Or I can say, I am quite satisfied that you are wrong, meaning, my friend, you're wrong, and I'm absolutely convinced that you're wrong. The word is the same word. You can't feed that into a machine and be guaranteed to get the right answer. And indeed, you can have a legal translator also get it wrong. And then when I look at the draft French translation, I realize that they've got the wrong meaning. There we go. Thank you. Now, talking, uh, mentioning China, what I wanted to simply to say that uh, my impression, my personal, and not just me, but also the other professors who are with the with the, this Chinese EU school of law uh, for more years. Uh, and I used to have also one of my colleagues and bosses actually, uh, who, was, who used to be the uh, consul of Volkswagen, which established the very first Volkswagen, the very first foreign joint venture company in Shanghai. And he lived there for quite a number of years. And basically he confirmed this thing. And the essence, gist of what I wanted to communicate is that 10 years ago or six or seven years ago, the Chinese, they were recipients of Western law, be it US or Europe, okay? That is not so anymore, okay? And even them, you know, they say that, well, things have changed and it's maybe high time to see that we have also developed something which are different uh, and talking about, for example, uh, uh, the Chinese School of Law organizes each and every year a 
joint conference specifically in Beijing on topics which are related, uh, which are of top interest to uh, the European Union because there is some kind of China-EU dialogue. And during the last two years, that was all focused basically on data protection, big data, and exactly these internet uh, technology related things. And essentially you could see that the Chinese first said that yes, the European approach is maybe the right thing to do. We realize the Americans, they have something different as you may see in case of Facebook and other things. And uh, you know, last time what I could read out from the presentations of you know, more than 10 Chinese professors is that, gee, you know, we, have, we are in the process of developing our own, which is different. And we think that maybe the Europeans should also take a look at it because it could be that in certain respects it's better because the European tends to be too paternalistic, too protective, you know, and too limit, basically limiting the hands of business people. So this is what I wanted to say that, and it's not the, this is not just the only field. Uh, I think that, you know, rapid changes are happening on, on, on in many, many fields of law, talking about bankruptcy, same thing. You know, they passed the first one, 2000, uh, or so 1990s, 1990s uh, to a great extent following German model, 2007 they said basically, this is not really working, it's not really, okay, we will take the US approach because of chapter 11 reorganizations. 2007, you know, they have a new one and they are in the process of, of learning, changing things. This is what I wanted to simply say that presumably, or not presumably, my opinion is that very soon, basically, you will see Chinese products which will be worthwhile and we will have to take a look at them. Uh, whether we will take them seriously, whether they will, be, they will have impact on the others, I think it will depend on social, economic, business reasons, uh, depending on how things will develop in the future. Okay. And uh, if, I, if I may, just two sentences talking about these uh, algorithms. Uh, I agree with all these things. I uh, have just had a talk with some algorithm experts at my university. Uh, raising the question, exactly this question, what is going to happen? Can you, you know, transform law into algorithm? To what extent? And basically they also confirmed that at the present stage that's not really possible. So you can do certain things, but many things cannot be really done. Uh, but my position is, and think about it, I do think that there is a difference from between branch of law versus branch of law. And I do think that in case of branches all over where you have lots of discretion given to the judges or bankruptcy trustee, their uh, algorithms have a problem. But you have some areas of law which are basically a kind of pretty routine. Okay, and let me give an example. I teach, I teach for example, uh, the, Amer the Americans call it secure transactions law, the British call it personal property security law. And essentially if you take a look at what is being taught, it's a very simple thing. You have to register a very simplified form, one page, and then you have a priority. That's it. And if you read the uh, cases which resolve the disputes, actually even the, uh, you, uh, there's a Knox case, I can tell you even the name, where the judge simply said that we, in this case, we, have, we had the issue whether to provide justice to the parties or rather to ensure that the system works unhindered, just like it worked. Because, you know, this field, secure transactions, so crediting, leasing, and all these things, basically in 90-90% of the cases works without any kind of a problems. Very few disputes, okay? You need just to go through all these things. And basically the court said that, sorry, we think that it's better to serve injustice in two cases altogether because they, you know, they, uh, have tried to find cases from the, for, throughout the United States which dealt with the same issue. And they said that we found altogether on all level each, each state only two. And it is better to serve some injustice in these two cases than to completely disrupt the industry. And now, you know, my simple, I'm just a lawyer, you know, I'm not a, I don't really have a degree in uh, algorithms or anything of that sort, just a simple logic that it could be that you know in this field maybe there is a possibility to to you know transform law into something else 
uh, as opposed to let's say bankruptcy, which is my other field, where exactly the, the tendency is exactly in the, in the going the other direction that you have more and more discretionary powers are given to the bankruptcy trustee, bankruptcy court, where you have a problem because discretion essentially means the human factor. So, uh, okay, one last question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question, probably more directed at uh, Ms. Sharpston, and probably Professor Ziemel will also have something input in, in this question. You talked a lot about uh, the human errors that happen when, when litigants appear before the court, and of course, it's it's uh, it's very interesting to hear about them. And it makes me wonder whether whether judges would actually prefer machines to be litigating. <laughs> so no, we, my question we prefer is, good advocates. Yeah. My question is, can you distill maybe um, out of uh, your experience, what then would be those ideal rules that you would want to see in a litigant that comes before the court? What would be those ideal things that you would want to hear, see? Um, what would make a successful and pleasant for every judge, regardless of their background? <laughs> um, Focus and common sense. That was quick. I mean, I think there is uh, clearly uh, for the for the bench a preferred uh, litigant. It's it's sort of very clear uh, how that uh, lawyer should look like in terms of uh, you know in what way the argument should be presented, and uh, most of that already came in your in your talk and I can only subscribe to that uh, having been a judge now for many years that the judges really prefer to have a, someone who keeps the time gets the main message across um, and does not shoot all of those birds yeah that, that, that's that's the best one <laughs> okay ladies and gentlemen I hate to be a fun breaker but uh, uh, I need, uh, you know, I was just advised that focus is what's required. So um, um, I would definitely like to thank uh, our panelists. Um, and uh, I, I hope that uh, we will continue discussions on these particular topics or maybe other uh, topics at uh, the Hotel Gutenbergs, where the reception uh, will be held. This place is literally around the corner, and the weather is nice, so we are blessed in many ways. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, bearing with us. And for those who uh, want to have some fun stories about the history of RGSL, you're more than welcome to grab a free copy of, um, of a book on the first 20 years of, of RGSL uh, that is put on, on this table. So uh, read it and enjoy it. So see you in a few minutes on the roof.